Welcome to Ability Awakens, a podcast about provocative insights in the arts of therapy, behavior, and spirituality as meaning making. Good day, Dr. Joseph Randolph Bowers here, and I'm asked by several people to talk about what is behavior support, and particularly I'd like to emphasize integral behavior support. This talk goes out to parents and support workers and people that are dealing with behavioral concerns and who need behavior support. The insights in this talk could be helpful to a whole range of people. And we're not just talking about disabilities here, we're talking about everyone really, because behavior is a human phenomenon and that means that it is relevant to all of us in daily life. And no one in this universe is truly an expert. We are all, in one sense, the only expert on our own personal experiences. And parents are the experts in terms of knowing, understanding, living with what their child has been going through for years. Uh, In a similar way, support workers who are, you know, in the trenches day to day with people and supporting them, They have their own level of expertise and insights as well to offer. So everybody has their perspectives and the individual that's struggling with behavioral issues is also an expert in their own experiences and that needs to also be respected. This is central to the notion of integral behavior support that draws in a range of perspectives into the method. The first part of integral behavior support and perhaps the most important part is called person-centered support and person-centered support comes from a long tradition in the western um, psychotherapy as well as the helping professions Uh, within the psychotherapy field carl rogers founded the field of field of uh, person-centered psychotherapy and uh, he talked about core values in therapy that were really orienting the therapist and helping the client towards uh, useful outcomes and goals. One of those core values is unconditional positive regard and this is incredibly important in our work and lives to have an attitude of unconditional positive regard. In older cultures, we might have called this a compassion and a loving kindness and a great deal of patience. In the modern sense, unconditional positive regard is about holding in abeyance our critical ideas, critical thoughts, and our critiquing of ourselves and other people, and actually highlighting our strengths and capacities and what we do in a positive sense, and looking at that, um, looking at that in a positive way and holding that up and affirming that having an affirmational attitude is really important having an attitude of gratitude is also equally important and central components of this concept this practice actually of unconditional positive regard which is really at that level as a daily practice reorients our life towards other people and it reorients our mind and our hearts towards ourselves in a much more positive way. Another core value of person-centered support is listening. Listening is one of those core skills that people need to have and that is so overlooked and often underrated. And listening is probably one of the most important values. And it is central to unconditional positive regard. And it's really highly central to person-centered support. When we actually listen to somebody, we're not just hearing what they have to say. We're actually taking in the whole person, seeing them in their context, affirming them as such, and building them up. And... um, and highlighting their positive aspects while we are attempting to understand and being curious about what they're saying or expressing not just through words but non-verbally through their actions and through their behaviors. Listening is a deep abiding respect. It's a practice of mindfulness really. It's a mindfulness that is active and participatory and It is an orientation of the self towards curiosity that is continual. This 
doesn't end. We don't sort of get the answer and then we move on. Listening is a way of life that is continual and ongoing. And so each new day, we learn something new from each individual that we're with. Our partner, our friend, our colleague, our uh, person that we support, the person that we struggle with, our teacher, uh, or a part of ourself internally that we're struggling with or that is frustrating or stops us up in some way. These parts of ourselves are also our teachers. And the more we come to terms with that, the more we can listen to what's really going on. Listening in this sense is becoming awake. It's, it's awakening to a new perspective on life and it's learning. It's a, it's a learning and a growing that is opening the self to new experiences. Listening never closes us off from life. Listening always opens us up. And I think this is a central value of unconditional positive regard and person-centered support, that our listening opens us up to having a deeper and more authentic relationship with ourself and with another person. The next aspect of person-centered support is highlighting the values of the person. And this really means that an individual's values takes time to learn. We can't just assume we understand or we know what the person values. What is important to that individual will take time to understand. And that time needs to be given in a relationship, in a context of support and genuine concern. Human rights and human gifts are also really central to person-centered support. The layer of human rights is that we each have inalienable rights, and this is true of people also with disabilities, mental health concerns, uh, chronic health and illness issues, medical concerns, learning capacity concerns and difficulties as well uh, in the education field. So this crosses a lot of different areas in life and society. Human rights are central to person-centered support. So we want to highlight an individual's basic human rights and make sure that these are attended to and addressed on a day-to-day -day basis and that the decisions that we make and the way that we support an individual fits within that framework. That's really important in terms of the international and also Australian standards. The giftedness level of human capacities there is that we're highlighting the individual's capacities, strengths, and abilities, as well as looking at these as gifts in a very authentic and integral way, because we are taking a strength-based approach, and we're going to talk about that a bit more later, but at this level, we're looking at things in a very positive light, that even a person with profound disabilities does have gifts and strengths, and you know, we, we see that, we experience that, we hear that, we know that. If and usually only if we take this holistic approach that reframes our core presuppositions, our core values, and gives us a sense of positive strength-based uh, work and of perspective. The next core area of person-centered support is that the person has insight and decision-making ability. And this is really important to highlight as well, that every person, regardless of their strengths and weaknesses, even individuals with profound disabilities, for example, with intellectual disability, where a person can't function alone in society and needs the support of systems and people around them, even that individual has the human right and capacity to make decisions on a daily basis within their capacity, within the framework or the understanding of what their capacity is and how they exercise that on a day-to-day -day basis. Obviously, you know, we don't, don't expect an individual who can't manage their financial life to to make financial decisions and manage a budget on a weekly or monthly basis, you know. They are supported through a disability pension, for example, and through the public guardian in Australia that provides for that financial management level of life to make sure that their income is secure and, and it is um, funneled to the very necessary areas like rent and food and medical care and whatnot. So there are aspects in which we support the person 
so that we understand their limitations and strengths and how they actually, you know, in a concrete way, can exercise their decision-making ability on a day-to-day -day basis. Another core area is that is that person-centered support highlights what is important to the individual and what is important for the individual and understanding these two different areas is really important. There's a sense of duty of care as well as dignity of risk and what that means is that what's important to the individual it comes from their own personal values. An individual might really love and enjoy a certain television show or, or certain actors or they might really enjoy a certain kind of food and that that really gives them uh, a great deal of joy and, and happiness on a day-to-day -day basis and you know uh, allowing the individual and supporting that that interest and that that um, aspect of what's important to them whether the food or the entertainment or the or the particular relationship that they're drawn to etc these things are important to the individual and they need to be respected and and integrated into their support profile as much as you can do that right and Important for is a little bit, bit more broad kind of perspective. This is the often perspective of the um, support person or family member who can see the bigger picture and understands what, in, what is important for the individual. And we often find that the important to and the important for can be at, at loggerheads or in conflict with each other when they're pitted against each other. But when we look at things in a way of integral support, we want to bring these values together and see them as a circular process where each has their place and each can be honored and supported. The next major area in integral behavior support is the strength-based method. And the strength-based method is really about having a approach and attitude of empowering an individual towards their best life, towards their best outcome, their best skills and capacities. It's about allowing and supporting choice and control at whatever level that can be exercised on a day-to-day -day basis and also whatever ways that can be supported in a planning process in terms of making you know larger life decisions and, and, and whatnot. For example, where a person lives, what kind of place they live in, who they live with, you know, at, at, at that level, however an individual could contribute to those parts of decision-making processes would seem pretty important to highlight and respect in whatever way you could. Strength-based methods highlight an individual's st strengths, obviously, and their capacities and their skills. It's an affirmational approach. It's diversional in the sense that we would divert an individual towards their strengths when questionable sort of behaviors are, are coming up. For example, if an individual is is uh, exercising sort of risky behavior and may harm themselves, we'd attempt to divert them towards an area of their strengths and interest instead of sort of taking a negative approach and focusing on what's happening that is wrong, so, quote unquote. We would focus on we would focus on diverting them in a circular fashion, uh, moving around that issue in a way that creates another opportunity for growth and change or just a change of, uh, of orientation or behavioral perspective. The next major area for integral behavior support is that it is a holistic and ecological approach or method and this means that we look at people in, in context in their environments and in the context of their relationships and we look at them as being independent at some level and we look at them as being dependent at some level but we ultimately come to a perspective where we see them as being interdependent which is a way of thinking a way of looking at life that we see both the dependence and the independence and we see how these are interrelated and we see that ultimately we're all in one sense or other interdependent on one another on our environment on our relationships 
uh, and those relationships uh, are you know in the concrete in terms of they can be observed in our environments and our relationship with things and places for example but they're also internal our relationships with the parts of ourselves our relationship for example with our emotions versus our memories uh, versus our reactions to certain stimulus or to uh, things that we're reactive to in the environment like allergies or whatnot and it's understanding those interrelationships and understanding that we're all in some sense interdependent and this gives us a really clear or at least a clearer view of what a person is dealing with and and how to work with that on a day-to-day -day basis. And basically, we're looking at how to orient those relationships toward positive outcomes wherever possible. The next major area that we're going to discuss in terms of integral behavior support is looking at a solution-focused approach. Solution-focused approaches are looking for how to they're practical, pragmatic, they're simple in a lot of ways, or at least they attempt to simplify complex situations into doable chunks, things that can be done stepwise and um, perhaps in certain orders. And it's a down-to-earth perspective. It's a can-do attitude kind of approach, solution-focused work. And it's really central to person-centered support because you know, at the end of the day, you're not going to have a behavior specialist, therapist, or clinician whispering in your ear what to do. You're going to be given a behavior support plan at some level if a, if a plan's actually written by the clinician. And you're going to have to interpret that yourself, and you're going to have to put it into practice yourself. And it's important to understand then what the core principles are of of that behavior practitioner's approach and I'm not saying their approach will be my approach they they may not have the uh, core values or or methods that I'm discussing today here but they in some sense will be manifesting a behavior support plan that you need to implement and I'm saying that you know you could take on these core functional and positive attitudes yourself and you can interpret just about anything that they might throw at you or put at you in their behavior plan and you could interpret it in a positive way and you could apply it in a way that's actually functional and that works for you and works for the individual that you're working with which is really the key you know it's really the most important thing how does it work how does behavior support work well that's a complex question. It depends on what level you're asking the question. But I'll give a global answer at the moment in the sense that generally behavior support in modern society today works in the sense that we have three levels. We have a senior assessment, a senior clinical assessment, and we have a junior assessment and junior perspectives on what's going on. And we have day-to-day behavior support implementation. These three different levels happen in different cases at different times. In my role, I'm a senior clinical specialist in behavior support, and that means that I come at things from a very holistic and complex perspective. I often work with some of the most complex cases that exist. And so these cases may include, for example, complex disabilities, complex mental health conditions and complex medical and, um, and uh, chronic health conditions and all of those three different aspects of, uh, of what a person's dealing with overlap and interact in really as I say complex ways a person with profound disabilities and mental health conditions and chronic illness and disease has a lot to deal with in life and their their issues overlap and interact in very profound and significant ways and the more that we can understand the complexities and how they overlap and interact the better off we are to provide 
more adequate support and more of a support that's practical and actually makes a difference. It's often very difficult to understand what will make the most difference in a complex situation. And one of the principles I use to help me in assessment and, and in orienting people towards helping on a daily basis with implementation of behavior support is that it's not always the big issue that makes the most difference in terms of positive directions. It's often the smallest change in a system or a person's life that makes the biggest difference. But the key and the kind of magic of daily behavior support and making it work is finding the smallest thing that can be changed that makes the most difference. Sometimes that's providing a level of comfort or sometimes it's distilling a level of stress or anxiety or sometimes it is providing an object of enjoyment or at other times it's taking away an object and replacing it with something that's more fun and interesting or at other times it's providing more physical stimulation like exercise or engagement in the environment or getting out more often sometimes it's an issue with sleep or with some other aspect of uh, daily life and health and lifestyle um, and you know often uh, the solutions are not necessarily directly related to the behavior of concern and it takes a talented clinician with a lot of years of experience to be able to look at what's going on in a complex situation and provide suggestions for how to how to move forward how to potentially diffuse the behaviors of concern and the risks and dangers that are happening in the in the person and in the in their environment and how to move that forward in a positive sense to build a positive lifestyle a more functional lifestyle health approach to um, to supporting the individual at that first level of senior assessment we look at creating a functional kind of perspective that leads to the writing of a behavior support plan and really the core of the behavior support plan is about implementing support strategies and preventing risk and harm wherever possible. This is to help family and staff on how to support a person in day-to-day -day life and so we look at in this analysis a whole range of areas but some of those parts are looking at the history of the individual and in that sense it provides us with a sense of the origin of certain issues where that came from and how it evolved over the years. We look at the individual's strengths and their weaknesses and this is kind of an in-depth process. It's not just a, uh, it's not skimming the surface here. We're really looking at um, the looking at the strengths of the individual and discussing those and listing them and this can be quite a lengthy list and um, one of the most exciting areas for me in doing a clinical review like this is that when I ask people about the strengths of the individual they kind of find it difficult sometimes to highlight or to articulate those strengths and so that's a process of uh, helping the people around the individual to build a strength-based approach in their attitudes you know and you know that's part of reality really we all deal with the uh, ins and outs of supporting people from day to day we we live with our you know in everyday life we live with our partners and we see their not so good aspects you know we smell their farts we uh, see them wake up in the morning with wrinkled faces and um, wrinkles around their eyes and we see them yawning and tired and we see them getting frustrated and angry and we have conflicts with them and we are in the trenches in our relationship so it's kind of no wonder that we don't necessarily see and articulate the strengths of our partner and actually going through that exercise and really looking at that in an in-depth way is really helpful and that's true amongst people that are supporting supporting others who have behaviors of concern and looking at their strengths is a really useful thing to do of course, we need to understand the, the weaknesses of the person and these need to be framed in a person-centered 
positive way as well. Everybody has weaknesses. We all have areas where we've got capacity and other areas in life where we really don't have capacity, where it's a learning edge or where it's frustrating or difficult or or where we're just not capable of doing certain things. Um, and this is part of our uh, humanity. We need to acknowledge this in a positive light and work with it effectively. Another aspect of the clinical review will look at conditions that the person has, medical or otherwise, and we'll need to look at their medications and see how the medications interact and, and what their functionality is in terms of helping the individual. We need to understand and map out what the behaviors of concern actually are, what they look like, how they function. Then we also need to understand strategies to work with those behaviors of concern. And we also need to have some prevention strategies to help prevent risk and, and harm if that is a part of the situation. And the behavior support analysis will also look at what's called restrictive practices. And these are areas that restrict an individual's liberty and freedom in some manner uh, in their day-to-day -day life and that are called restrictive because there's actually, in Australia at least, there's laws and policies that govern these areas and how they're applied or not applied. And this was part one of the introduction to integral behavior support and part two will look at the core beliefs and values that guide our work in positive behavior support and we look forward to having you continue with us during our discussion. Thank you so much. I'm your host, Dr. Joseph Randolph Bowers. We are Ability Awakens podcast, a provocative, insightful show about the arts of therapy, behavior, and spirituality as meaning-making. Thank you for welcoming us in and for listening and being with us today.